order. We have one, two, three, four, five, all the members of the uh, committee here. Uh, and so I'm calling to order the uh, meeting of the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee uh, on Monday, November the 1st. It is uh, 529. We apologize for the uh, tardiness of the beginning of this meeting. I will look to the mayor for I will look to the mayor for our land acknowledgement this evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and many others who cared for their families and communities the way we now seek to care for ours. The Town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake Simcoe Nottasaga Treaty of 1818 and respects all of the nation to nation agreements that have formed relationships with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. The reality of our shared history, the current contributions of Indigenous peoples within our community, and seeks to continue empowering expressions of pride amongst all of the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better, to continue to recognize, learn, and grow in friendship and community nation to nation. Thank you. Item number two on our agenda this evening is the adoption of our agenda. And the motion is that the content of the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee agenda for November 21st be adopted as presented. I will need a mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Vice Chair Madigan, seconded by Councillor Berman. Uh, do we, uh, I will call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Item number uh, three is declarations of pecuniary interest. Do any of the members of this committee uh, have uh, declarations of pecuniary interest they wish to make at this time? Seeing none, deputations, and we have two of them this evening. Uh, the first is about the Tremont Plaza Public Art Project. And so I will introduce uh, the director Calvert, um, who is going to uh, bring in, I can see the arts and culture coordinator, uh, Tanya Maza. Uh, and so I will hand that over to you. Uh, you have 10 minutes and not a second more. <laughs> I'll take less uh, than one you. second. Sorry, I'm just gonna introduce Tanya and then I'm gonna back out. Go ahead, Tanya, thanks. <laughs> Um, good evening, Mayor Saunderson, Chair McLeod, and Council. Um, as you know, an open call to artists was issued last April to commission public artwork for the Tremont Plaza with the theme of celebrating LGBTQ plus life and community. An ad hoc public art working group was assembled to develop the objectives and vision for the project and to select the final artwork. I'd like to thank this group for their time and enthusiasm over the last six months and getting us to this exciting milestone. I'm pleased to introduce the artist whose proposal was selected to be brought to life at the Tremont Plaza, sculptor and architect, William W. Hum. Thanks, Tanya. Um, thank you, Mayor, and all the members of the committee for giving me this, this opportunity to present my design proposal to all of you tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to have been selected for um, this new exciting piece of artwork that's gonna be installed in Tremont Plaza next year. And I've prepared a short video that gives you an overview of the design concept behind my proposal. And I'll be available for any questions afterwards. Thanks. Joyful, bold, and celebratory. Dare to dream is a work of public art which celebrates inclusion and diversity. Located at the center of Tremont Plaza, the work shall consist of a vertically oriented stainless steel arc that's slender in profile and elegantly curved. Perched on top of the arc is a cast bronze rhinoceros balancing on its hind legs as if it's about to take flight. The original competition brief put out by the town of Collingwood called for us to consider and engage experiences of resilience, strength, affirmation, belonging, transformative joy, and other topics that acknowledge the journey of LGBTQ individuals in our community. In response to this, I chose to incorporate an arc form in the work to recall a rainbow, which is a well-recognized symbol for the LGBTQ community. And harnessed to the rhino are eight balloons, each painted in one of the eight colors of the original pride flag designed in 1978. 
The artwork is a celebration of how far we have come as a community and as individuals. Dare to Dream is designed for people of all ages and all backgrounds. It is not only for those in the LGBTQ community, but for all of Collingwood and beyond. It aims to inspire curiosity, hope, and dreams in everyone. Dare to Dream is for anyone who has ever felt different, for anyone who has ever felt like they didn't belong, and for anyone who yearns for a community to call their own. It is a reminder that you are not alone and that as long as you dare to dream, even rhinos can fly. The overall height of the piece shall be about 13 and a half feet tall, while the footprint of the piece shall be relatively small, approximately three feet by three feet. The scale of the piece is in keeping with the pedestrian scale of the plaza. Tremont Plaza is frequently used throughout the year for events and fairs. The footprint of the piece has been kept to a minimum so that it will not be an obstruction during those events. At the same time, the height and vibrant colors of the piece will ensure that it is still visible from a distance. Dare to Dream will be a focal point that anchors the space and become a new landmark for the town of Collingwood. Are there any questions about the design? Uh, well, first, we'll go to, I believe, the, um, the public for any questions among the attendees at our meeting this evening. Clerk Almas, is there anybody from the, um, from the public who wishes to have anything to say? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair McLeod. Um, we'll open it up to the public when we look at uh, the staff. Thank you. Any members of the committee have questions for, uh, for uh, Mr. Hung? Seeing none, I have one. Um, why a rhinoceros? Why not a hippo or a unicorn? <laughs> not that I'm, you know, it's art, obviously, but just curious. The rhino is actually a lesser known symbol of LGBTQ resistance that dates back to the 70s. Um, in the mid 70s, there was this controversy over this public ad campaign that wanted to use the rhino to promote visibility for the LGBTQ community, but it was met with resistance from the authorities then. And so the rhino became a symbol of um, the community's resistance. And it actually made an appearance in a couple of gay pride parades in Boston. And uh, subsequently, um, uh, I think it made an appearance at maybe Boston City Hall, maybe there was some flag with the rhino on it that was actually displayed there. And uh, more recently in the gay village in Birmingham, England, uh, the UK, there uh, was this rhinestone encrusted rhino that was unveiled there. So um, there is some connection to um, LGBTQ history, but it's not so widely known. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we will, uh, with no further questions from the committee, we'll thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. That brings us to item number 4.2 on our agenda, which is Pollinate Collingwood 2021 Volunteer Activities. And we are looking for Shannon McCready, Carolyn Davis, Carrington Lozon, Jeff Young, and Jessica Lair. Uh, and they have a presentation for us. Good evening, uh, Mayor Saunderson, Chair McLeod, committee. First, we would like to thank the town of Collingwood for all their support. Oh, sorry, would you like to put up the slides, I guess? There we go, yay, good evening. <laughs> I'm keen, as you can tell. Are you good for me to go then? Yes, please. And you have uh, you have 10 enthusiastic minutes. Woo Yay, thank you. So we'll start over. Good evening, Mayor Saunderson, Chair McLeod, and committee. First, we would like to take a moment to thank the Town of Collingwood for all of their support over the past 20 months. We have had the opportunity to volunteer alongside the Parks Program, Healthy People, Healthy Community Initiatives, the Library, and Museum staff. 
Thank you for sharing our work on social media, sharing the physical space for many of our pollinator gardens and to all the staff that have given time to our endeavors. Next slide. Pollinate Collingwood is a volunteer led initiative. Our team of directors is experienced and passionate about her work and will be introduced here. I am Jessica. I have the white hat on in that image. I have an undergraduate degree focusing on protected spaces, a teaching degree and a master's focusing on stewardship and community engagement and careers in those fields with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Ontario Parks, including a species at risk biologist. Jeff is there with his son. He is a master naturalist, owner of Not A Farm, which is an organic farm. Carrington, who couldn't join us tonight, is standing beside me with a striped shirt. She is the owner of Earth Revival, which is a native plant nursery and is all around a general expert in native plants and has wonderful um, sign design skills. She's been really helpful that way with us. Shannon, who is holding the sign, comes and joins us with a teaching degree, and she focuses on educational planning and our education grant program, which you'll learn more about later. Carolyn, who is bending in the picture, has a degree in, or in zoology that focuses on insects and a master's in environmental science, research in ecological impacts of land use disturbance on native bumblebees careers in species at risk breeding, science education, and community outreach. Together, we are Pollinate Collingwood. Our dual mission is to one, take action in support of, and two, raise awareness of Ontario's native pollinators. Our projects and initiatives are aimed at focusing the collective energy and resources of community members to improve native habitats and their stewardship in the town of Collingwood and the broader region. This all occurs under five strategic priorities, which we will now outline and our successes within them this past year. Habitat stewardship, education and outreach, municipal policy, pollinate network and development and governance in which each of the previous priorities are accounted for by metrics, financial statements, planning documents and more. So first up is habitat stewardship. Next slide, please. Thank you. In terms of gardens in Collingwood, there are close to 30 native plant gardens that we've put in. Local businesses, schools, town sites, town community gardens, community gardens, and resident gardens. Some gardens are in the ground, others are in raised beds, and of course there's one in, at, inside of a canoe down at Sunset Point. Many of these gardens were started under the David Suzuki Foundation Butterflyway Program, which is a nationwide volunteer-led initiative Collingwood is considered a butterfly way community because we have over 12 such gardens. In terms of rewilding, we have been working along a section of Poplar Side Road uh, right off of the Mountain Croft subdivision. We began this year by letting the area grow naturally, not mowing it to see what the natural seed bank was. This October, we planted 50 native plants and added in 30 native trees along the section. Carrington developed a really fabulous program um, towards the end of the summer that offered assistance to those locally who wanted a garden but had restrictions for various reasons, whether um, access to materials, financial barriers, um, physical abilities. And unfortunately, nobody applied, but we will try it again next year. We're trying to make um, gardening as such as inclusive as possible in our community. When, next slide, when looked at locally, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the town's pollinate Collingwood story map. And with this visual, there's an opportunity to educate, tell the story of our community and its commitment to native pollinators. Thank you to Lindsay Gosnell, who gave volunteer hours to develop the site and for the town hosting it. This is an incredible tool that we use whenever we speak in classrooms or anything such like that, because you get to see where there is absence of these gardens um, and where we actually have lots of them and that connectivity across the community. There's an opportunity to really promote the work of the town um, and what it undertakes on this map and website, as well as the other locations on town websites as well. Okotoks, Alberta, for example, has great short interviews with park staff um, and others about the town out there and how it supports pollinators. In terms of education and outreach, Next slide. 
Uh, we've had a busy year. We have given virtual presentations to various high school classes, the Town of Collingwood series on the land we love, and local community interest groups, including the Nature League. In-person education programs were given at Cameron Street Public School, and it was at using their outdoor classroom, which was a treat. Special events have included National Pollinator Week, in which we gave out close to 300 plants. That was down in front of the Seawood sign. Um, National Pollinator Week is, of course, the third week of June. We also had a documentary night um, where attendees could learn about other native plant initiatives and receive a free plant as well. We have a school grant program, which enables local schools to plant native pollinator gardens and other initiatives that are connected within pollinator programs. CCI is currently working with a grant of $500. This year, all schools also receive books about, about native plants and pollinator gardening. We also supported other events and local initiatives, including the staycation kits for both the museum and the library, which included a native seed giveaway and Blue Mountain Watershed Trust with See the Salmon Run, that event. In terms of social media and media, Facebook and Instagram were well used. We had over 900 contacts, um, about 400 or so on each, and had a great interview with CBC Ontario Morning, 10 written articles and social media posts to, um, with support from the town sites. So thank you for that. These are just, next slide. A few of the metrics that we are tracking to measure our impact this year. In addition, we've estimated over 400 hours of volunteer time and other in-kind donations valued at close to $9,500 and our activities have raised an additional $1,400 above Julie DiLorenzo's annual contribution of $5,000 over five years, so a total of $25,000. As with everything, of course, there are challenges and opportunities. Education and outreach, like most things, COVID was certainly a challenge. There was restrictions, obviously, to volunteer engagement and ability to get the locals with their hands in the dirt, which is something we would really like to um, get involved in. We couldn't provide, uh, provide a large scale education learning event, which we would like to offer. And that has sort of been in the book since the beginning. So we are two years out from that. Hopefully next year, um, opportunities will be presented differently. Opportunities were certainly taken. We recommended a story for the outdoor story walk about native pollinators and it's on the Heritage Park Community Garden fence. We were also involved as stated earlier with the staycation kits and we took every opportunity to be online for talks. In terms of habitat, there were also some challenges. Garden bed preparation and care, mostly centered around pre-season weeding and bed preparation, seasonal weeding and seasonal watering. But we looked at it, this as an opportunity for next year. Perhaps the opportunity to create a signed document outlining town commitments to the pollinator gardens and our commitments as well. Uh, we would look at creating native plant identification sheet for summer employees that are weeding in the pollinator gardens, which will help the town care for their care commitments. Explore and adopt a garden by community volunteers to help the town and pollinate Collingwood with labor load, though the town has worked with annual plants in each of the new pollinator gardens prior to this year, which means that there has been a town budget covering garden plants and care in the past. In addition, involving local volunteers helps build our local community for mental, physical health, and certainly environmental health. Pollinate Collingwood has become part of a regional network. And it seems to be really centered around both B City Canada and David Suzuki Foundation Butterfly Ways. Locally, both in and out of our county, including Aurelia, Barrie, Midland, New, New Tecumseh, Severin, and the county itself. The county became a B City this September. There are also local initiatives just outside of our county, including Rob Roy, Town of Blue Mountains, and Meatford, all who had volunteer groups put in Butterfly Way Gardens this year. Meaford is also working towards becoming a Bee City Canada. Creemore has also been in discussions with us along the way about pollinator gardens. We have created some great contacts. And in fact, I had one today from two women over a town of Blue Mountains who are looking to apply to their town for a grant under education for the next year um, for pollinator gardens as well and educational materials. Um, all of this started through the David Suzuki Foundation, which has been a wonderful connect throughout this process. Collingwood has a great opportunity to be a leader in supporting native pollinators, which leads us 
next slide, to our last commitment as Pollinate Collingwood, and that is municipal policy. We ourselves provide education and support of current town policies and bylaws pertaining to pollinators. This comes in the form of face-to-face -face communication and even online communication when people have questions about planting boulevards and more. We recognize that there is a commitment within our B-City Canada application to create a pollinator strategy for the town within five years. We are here to support this initiative. So what does a pollinator strategy look like? Next slide, please. It is a guiding document, easily accessed document by the public that puts all related information and reasoning together with bylaws and policies, whether it be for questions about boulevards, leaf pickup, gas blowers, community gardens, naturalized personal property, and the definition of what that property means, and so on. The gold standard, of course, is Toronto's pollinator protection strategy, but there are many smaller communities that are undertaking this as well, including Okeechobee, Alberta. What goes in it? Scientific support for, municipal support for, including town recognizing the climate crisis, which this certainly connects to, goals, vision, objectives, a review of existing bylaws and internal policies and how they may or may not change and why change is occurring. Steps to enact the changes, measurable actions, and a timeline, links to supporting organizations and their support. So here is an ask that we have as Pollinate Collingwood. We are asking for the hiring of a contractor to research and write a town of Collingwood pollinator strategy, write the new bylaws with legal experience, conduct open houses of sur or surveys as required to engage the local community, include in the strategy and approved implementation process. Pollinate Collingwood commits to contributing in the following ways. Help provide a link between the town, the consultant and the community, Help to provide a link between the development of the document with experts in the field. Help to review documents and engage in discussion for background documents, the new strategy and implementation, and certainly carry on with our existing commitments as pollinate Collingwood, as we have outlined in this presentation, all of which supports the town. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lair. Uh, Questions, comments, queries from the committee. Councillor Comey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, um, I, I suppose perhaps to Director Culver, I heard that ask obviously at the end of this uh, lovely presentation. I'm wondering, is that presently a budget consideration? Director Culver? Yeah, through you, Chair, no, it's not currently uh, identified within our 2022 budget um, uh, draft as, we, as it sits right now. Okay, thank you for that answer then. Uh, uh, as a follow-up, Chair, I suppose sure. through you to the pollinate calling group who wants to take it. Is it a, could someone help me understand our commitments as a bee city and a pollinator community and having this type of strategy is, was that the expectation of the David Suzuki Foundation that this would, that we would follow through on it, so to speak? Who would like to take that? Ms. Lair. Thank you. Uh, this commitment follows under B City Canada, which is under Pollinator Partnership Canada and not David Suzuki Foundation. So this is part of that application that was okayed last year through council. And within that application, the town had to exhibit um, and with help obviously of ourselves and other environmental non-government uh, organizations, um, education that happens, support of National Pollinator Week, and um, increased um, and continued work on habitat. With that is also goals for the future and written in that and okayed prior to its submission was the goal for a town pollinator strategy within five years. Please note again, in terms of the one example I provided, the town or the city of Toronto, that is an incredible document. And as said, gold standard. Um, when going forth, I think it's a great model, but not the expectation that we should necessarily been looking at. Ours gets to be evolved to what our community needs, um, what the 
public states what the town needs. I'm aware that the town does get questions regarding boulevards often enough. Um, it's an opportunity to obviously address safety concerns as well um, for park staff and perhaps why they do or do not work in certain boulevards or other areas. Um, so I, in terms of me, it's a very proactive document that can help drive um, positive change forward. Uh, through you, Chair, that, thank you for that answer. I, you know, at everything time is so funny through all the virtualness. I do recall that application to Bee City Canada, and I know it's something the town has celebrated, you know, very proudly, and it's a beautiful addition to our signage. So if this is a natural continuation of that commitment we've made as a town, and we're willing to have that beautiful Bee City Canada, you know, logo everywhere and enjoy the benefits of, of saying we're, you know, pollinator friendly, it seems like a natural progression, but uh, I'll look to you, Chair, if we need to put a motion forward at this time to just have it added for consideration, I may be willing to move that. Well, we'll see what the other comments and questions from the committee is before we uh, entertain any motions. Are there uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, then I would suggest that we are looking for uh, a motion or a discussion regarding this ask or uh, something to that effect. And seeing none, I guess we will thank our, uh, oh, Councillor Comey. Pardon me, Chair, I thought it was, it was implied you were gonna circle back to me after circulating to the rest of the committee. So as I stated, I would like to put a motion forward to see if we could consider having staff add a line item to our budget uh, for a consultant to uh, come back with some po uh, pollinator strategies, but I'm open to hearing some comments from uh, the CEO or Director Culver. I don't want him to feel um, unprepared to do this, but as I said, I am in support of us at least having the opportunity to see a number and have a discussion with all of council during our budget deliberations. So I'll refer you to uh, Director Culver um, for those questions. Director Culver. Uh, through, through you, uh, Chair. Um, I, uh, so uh, this was brought to our attention a week ago, and although I know that there was a, a commitment back when, uh, when um, uh, Council uh, adopted the, the uh, B-City um, designation, um, Council is also very aware of where we're sitting with capacity levels and and uh, and how we're struggling, and so you know with with the full appreciation that this is extremely high on the the pollinate Collingwood uh, priority list and and with full appreciation of everything they've done and they, that they continue to do, um, you know we, we're struggling a little bit with trying trying to figure out how to do it, and uh, and so I feel like there were a number of options, uh, some of which uh, Jess uh, outlined. And, uh, and some of which we've, you know, sort of talked about in terms of, um, could we replicate a, another municipality's um, uh, strategy, you know, in the short term? And given that there's a five-year window to accomplish some of these objectives, um, that was sort of where we were at. Um, having said that, as I've said in other, in other uh, committee uh, uh, meetings, uh, we're never upset when council wants to, you know, push money in our direction and give us the opportunity to do more work with more funding. Uh, so certainly, um, you know, it, it's absolutely at council's discretion to to make those recommendations, to make those motions. Um, I think uh, the challenge that we're facing right now in the midst of uh, the budget is uh, the budget uh, build in order for you to have something to work with is uh, the 1% cap that was uh, placed on the budget and trying to fit all of the expectations, program services, um, inflation <laughs> and everything all within that 1%. Uh, so having said all that, if you refer it to staff, we'll do the best we can to come back with a strategy to, to help fulfill. We, we know that we committed to it when, when the council adopted the designation. Um, it's, it's a matter of timing, I think, is really where we're, we're struggling a little bit right now. Does that assist, Councillor Comey? 
It does. And I appreciate, you know, Director Culver being so candid. And I think as I would think as a council, we respect that it's an as for, I guess, a swag at a budget item to use a third party consultant. And like I said, I think it's reasonable for all of council to have an opportunity to discuss the pros and cons during budget deliberation. So I'm hoping at least as a committee, we could push it along enough that everyone gets a chance to have comment on this idea. So again, uh, I'd like to put a motion forward based on Paul Nate uh, Collingwood's ask for uh, a line item in the budget for a third party consultant for a pollinator strategy. That's the motion or the intent. Excellent. And do you have a, a seconder? Thank you. I have a seconder in, uh, in Councillor Berman. And so we will call the vote. Uh, all those in favor. And those opposed. And that moves into budget discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Staff reports, item number 5.1. Ah, Vice Chair Madigan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair McLeod. Uh, it is with deep regret that I must exit this meeting. I had some personal things come up at the last minute that are very time sensitive. So I do apologize and I leave uh, the rest of the meeting with my uh, fantastic colleagues. Thank you so much. And, and please accept my apologies. No problem. Thank you so much. All right, uh, item number 5.1, the Tremont Plaza Public Art Update. And uh, the recommendation, or well, we're going to hear from uh, we're going to hear from Deputy or from Executive Director Culver again. Hello, Chair, and thank you very much again. Um, uh, so you, you've heard from uh, Mr. Hong in terms of the uh, um, arts to be uh, presented. Um, everybody is very excited about getting started. The, the, the report you have in front of you is related to the fact that things accelerated a little more quickly than we, we imagined they would. Uh, this was lined up alongside the uh, mural project to replace heading dockside, as you'll recall. Um, however, that project had to take a bit of a side seat for a while uh, because of um, uh, something that's going on, which we can report to council, but soon it's all positive. Um, but this gave the opportunity for us to advance the, uh, the Tremont Square public art project. Um, so again, things finished a little more quickly than we, we uh, had imagined. And uh, what we're asking for is for um, the movement of some of the funds from the reserve, which were forecasted for next year expenditures into this year. It doesn't change anything in terms of the overall project, project budget. It doesn't change anything in terms of ta uh, impact to taxpayers. It's really more of a housekeeping item that allows us to, again, keep moving forward on the project at the pace that it's dictated, um, beginning with uh, you know, advancing the funds required for Mr. Hung to begin his work. So that's, uh, that's all that we're asking for at this moment. Thank you. Uh, any questions from members of the public regarding uh, this uh, staff report? Thank you, Chair McLeod. We do have a couple of attendees uh, participating in this uh, meeting today. If you'd like to address the staff report and the recommendation, please press the raise your hand feature and we will unmute you. Again, non-registered delegations have an opportunity to speak for a maximum of five minutes. And there's no one wishing to speak to this item at this time, Chair McLeod. Excellent. And so what we'll do is get the uh, recommendation on the table and then we can uh, have a conversation about it amongst ourselves. Uh, and that is that uh, staff report PRC 2021-09 Tremont Plaza Public Art Update be received and the council approved the transfer of $10,250 from the Public Art Reserve to be utilized in 2021 as the first payment to the selected artist. I will need a mover and a seconder for that. Moved by Mayor Saunderson, seconded by Councillor Berman. Questions, comments, queries, council. Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It, it was a, a very interesting presentation from uh, the artist William Hung, and uh, I think it's a very exciting initiative. I like the symbolism of it. I think it's a great location, and it'll be a great talking point uh, for people uh, down in that area in town. And uh, I think it uh, completely aligns with uh, our a number of local initiatives from public art displays to inclusiveness and uh, and to getting people out and, and walking through the community. So I, I think I'm absolutely in support of this project. 
Thank you. Anything else from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Uh, wonderful. So I will call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, uh, uh, Director Calder, I see your hand. It does not yes. have a hippo on it. Or rhinoceros. <laughs> or rhinoceros. Uh, sorry, Chair McLeod, and sorry to the committee, but I did I did want to take the opportunity to to say um, thank you to the committee that uh, supported the decision. It was a very very difficult. There were a lot of submissions uh, to the long list, um, a very difficult shortlisting uh, process, um, but the committee did very difficult work, and they did it in a uh, they 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 came to consensus, which doesn't always happen uh, when you have those committees, um, especially with something as subjective as as public art. Um, so, you know, while I had the opportunity, I wanted to make sure that they were recognized and, and, uh, and a thank you was issued to them. Consider it issued. And uh, I'll call the question on, uh, on this staff report. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Item 5.2 uh, I is, oh, uh, CAO Skinner. Best to turn your mic on. Makes it easier to hear you. Yes, it does. Um, I uh, wanted to wait for the vote to be done, but I, as a member of the LGBTQ2 plus community, I am really thrilled with this art piece. And I think it helps people to know how much we support and celebrate our diverse community. And it has a positive message for absolutely everyone. You don't have to be LGBTQ2 plus anything else. Um, and it is really in line with the huge supports that council and the huge efforts that council has made and that uh, Director Culver and his staff and the broader staff have made to uh, really move us forward on diversity and inclusion ever since, um, well, for, many, for a long time, but particularly since at the beginning of COVID when we had the uh, march at town hall from the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I think it's very much in line with our work with the Uni Unity Collective as well. So I hope everyone will tweet and share the fantastic news about more interesting things and more interesting art happening in Collingwood. Thank you for uh, the time. Thank you for those comments. Item 5.2 is T2021-20 uh, 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 water and wastewater arrears update and change to procedures. And I see the treasurer. Uh, to will bring us this uh, staff report. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Chair McLeod. I actually have um, Manager Graham and Analyst uh, Jansen on uh, as panelists as well. They're going to do the actual presentation of um, the options that we've presented to members of committee. I just wanna share that this was an update um, to the report we brought back in June in um, on water collections to SIC at the time. Um, we've made some great strides so far. Uh, we're just looking at different options and um, trying to come up with something that makes sense for both the community and, and, and the town. I will say that this has very much been a team effort um, from EPCOR as well as the water department and the bylaw department have all worked tirelessly along with finance to achieve what we have so far. So I'll let um, Manager Graham and Analyst Jansen take the uh, presentation up if we can have that going. All right. Good evening, Mayor Saunderson, Chair McLeod and committee members. Um, those were fantastic presentations before, very interesting. So I hope you find um, water just as interesting as I have and my team has over the past few months, near and dear to our hearts and especially with um, the funding of the new water treatment plant. So I guess since June, we focused on two main areas. If you can go to the first slide, please. Do I control it? Okay. Um, two main areas we focused on. One was the collection of some very significant arrears that needed to be addressed. And two was figuring out actually how to do this process better. So with respect to the collection of arrears, we had to take two different approaches and um, they were, were with respect to the tenants and the owners. And I'm gonna start with the little box on the right that says owners, because that's the easiest one to do. Um, essentially, it took about five treasury hours per quarter to collect that big number you see there, the $70,000 collected in June. And that was simply uh, by transferring 48 water accounts who hadn't paid their arrears in the month timeline they were given over to their property tax account. Oh, I, my camera, sorry. Uh, my camera is, the host is not allowing me to share my camera and I'm using arm gestures wildly. I'm not sure. 
Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, so here back to my arm gestures. So the, the owners were an easier process, five treasury hours per quarter to bring in, bring in that money. Um, and essentially it took only sending out about 112 letters over two quarters, giving uh, property owners one month to respond and pay, if not transfer their arrears. Whereas jumping over to the left-hand side of the slide, the tenants, the tenants, um, that process to collect took about collectively 350 um, hours across um, multiple departments, but mainly in the treasury department to collect $40,000 over four months. So you can kind of see uh, the difference there. And about 150 of those hours were actually mine as the finance operations analyst. So it was a big job, but again, it was it was very rewarding because huge collaboration between the Treasury Department, bylaw, um, water, and EPCOR as well. It also afforded us the opportunity to learn more about what everybody's process was. And actually, unfortunately or not, the opportunity to speak to a lot of tenants, property owners, and find, find out what the issues were and also be able to offer support. Um, we definitely didn't take a, a, a strong arm and hammer approach. We were, were very um, supportive and worked with residents around this. So um, in the end, we did deliver about 54 shutoff notices out to um, tenants living here. And it was about three to five per week, depending on the week, depending on staff availability. And it did actually only result in one water shutoff, which was a difficult process. But again, we were able to um, get that resident some supports in place to pay their water bills. And in turn, we get the money for that. So I guess um, overall, when you look at the results coming to the two boxes in the middle, in May, we started with an arrears balance. If you look at the number for tenants in there and owners and add them together, over $200,000 in arrears. And only four months later in September, when you look at the two numbers in there, we're down to just over $100,000. So we collected over hundred grand in four months, which is great. Um, but more importantly, when you look at the pie shapes in there in May, the breakout between tenants and owners is about 50%, give or take. You look at all that effort and what happened, um, down in September, the actual um, percentage of arrears weights more heavily on the tenant side, which is 70% of the arrears of that 100 grand relate to tenants. Even more interestingly is the fact that out of all our 12,000 water accounts, only about 10% um, of those relate to tenants. So that 10% makes up 70% of the arrears. So that's some data for you. There's a detailed table in the staff report. But having said that and give me kind of the, the data here, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Manager Graham to lead you through some of the options that we've come up with. Thank you, Analyst Jansen. That was really well done. If we can move to the next slide, I will start discussing the different options. So the first op option is to continue what we are doing and issue shutoff notices, with the difference being that we will now have a tenant consent form um, that will be required for accounts uh, held in tenant names as part of the initial account setup, wherein tenant account holders authorize consent to disclose their arrears balance to property owners. We have been working closely with EPCOR to develop the form, and it is included in the appendix in the staff report. The pros for this uh, procedure is that property owners will now have the authority to inquire about the status of tenant accounts before the owner notices are sent out and the balance accumulates. The cons, however, is that the town currently has approximately 1900 or 17% of our properties where water cannot be shut off due to shared connections, such as multi-unit dwellings, condominiums, legally detached or semi-detached dwellings. These properties have a higher tenanted occupancy proportion and the notice of shutoffs does not always provide the incentive for tenants to pay. The also another con is what Lara was uh, discussing previously, the process of issuing notice is extremely labor intensive. Following up on payments made between notices and deadline, payment arrangements and defaulted arrangements requires a significant amount of time from treasury. And finally, the Last con is shutting up water creates more distress for our residents. 
property owners and our staff during a time where there's already increased overall distress in our community from the length of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Option two is to eliminate shutoffs altogether and tax roll at 90 days past due. Account in arrears greater than 90 days and $300 will be transferred to tax roll. As mentioned in option one, the tenant consent form would still be required. The pros for this option is it allows the flexibility for owners to still continue to allow tenant accounts, but also have the authority to inquire on account status. It alleviates the issues of properties that cannot be shut off, and it reduces internal staffing time and increases efficiencies for collections. The con is that transferring to tax rule may not provide a strong enough incentive for tenant account customers to pay. And finally, our third option is to eliminate tenant accounts altogether. All residential accounts established after transition date must be opened and billed in the property owner name. Existing tenant accounts in good standing would remain in the tenant name until they move or um, are no longer in good standing. At that time, it would revert back to the owner. Pros, again, minimizes risk of not collecting. It alleviates the issues of properties that cannot be shut off, and it significantly reduces internal staff time. Cons would be that it would require significant education and communication to property owners. Transition time could be quite lengthy, and we would be uh, facing additional costs per month as the SLA agreement with EPCOR has uh, increased costs for um, notices that are sent out that do not have a hydro account. And finally, the next slide, our recommendations. Staff recommends option two. We uh, would like to eliminate shutoff and tax rules immediately at 90 days or greater than 300. It allows for tenant accounts. Um, owners have the authorization and access to status of their tenant accounts, and it reduces internal costs of administering shutoff notice. And owner accounts, we propose we continue the practice of transferring owner arrears to the property rule on a regular basis going forward to align with tenant arrears process. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And nobody got hit with anything, uh, which is one of the good things about Zoom meetings. Even you can move your hands as much as you want and you'll only hurt your desk or your wrist. Uh, we will turn to the public to see if there are any questions, concerns, or comments regarding this uh, staff report. Chair uh, Clerk Almas. Thank you, Chair McLeod. So again, if you're interested in speaking to the staff report and the recommendations, please press the raise your hand feature. And at this time, there's no uh, comments pertaining to this report, Chair McLeod. Excellent. So then we'll get it on the table. Uh, and the motion is the staff report T2021-20 water and wastewater arrears update and change to procedures be received for information. And that council authorize staff to move forward with waste and weight water and wastewater collections as follows. Initiating option two, which eliminates water shutoffs and moves to transferring tenant arrears to owner property tax accounts and continue with and formalize the process to transfer owner water arrears to property accounts, even in the event where an owner has sold a property. I will need a mover and a seconder for that to open up discussion. Moved by the mayor and seconded by Councillor Berman. Questions, comments, or queries from members of the committee. Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to staff. First of all, congratulations on the uh, the recovery there. That was a lot of work, and uh, we're hopeful, I guess, that this new process will prevent that kind of recovery effort in the future. And it just so for my understanding, this way, this option too really has the least amount of uh, middleman involvement uh, with the quickest amount of uh, a turnaround time so that an account that's in arrears is going to be brought to the landowner's attention very promptly, hopefully making sure that we get collection and we notice that the landowners tend to pay quicker than the, the tenants. So um, is that, it's just, it's more nimble and less involvement from town staff? I think I'm gonna pass that to Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Chair McLeod, and through you to um, his worship. Yes, I, I would definitely say it would speed things up. I think one of the biggest hurdles we had um, with the collections that we dealt with over the last several months is the fact that it has, it has built up so much over time. 
in this case um, under option two, albeit we're saying, you know, we will still chase the tenants. There is a, a limit to that and the um, the property owners will be well aware, you know, in advance of where say today that might um, doesn't happen quite as quickly. So I think it definitely reduces the amount of time in terms of lagging between what was um, what's owing. Uh, and, and our thoughts are that essentially um, for the most part, it shouldn't be greater than between say three and $400 per month, depending on the type of residential unit we're dealing with, or, or let me rephrase that three or $400 that would be tax rolled um, every 90 days, because that is the average amount um, uh, for a residential unit uh, currently. And just follow up if I may uh, yes. chair, um, certainly from some of the landlords we heard from, uh, this would go a long way, I think, to resolving their concerns uh, so that it's not a major hit. Uh, two years after the fact, they're made aware of it quite early on when it is not a dramatic amount of money and they can uh, make sure that they deal with the tenant accordingly. And, uh, and so it, it helps, I think, um, to make sure that these things get addressed before the stakes are too high. So I am absolutely in support of option two. Thank you. Other questions from members of the committee? Uh, seeing none, I have a couple, uh, and I'm I'm struggling to understand, uh, and I'm, I don't need 150 hours of explanation, but I wouldn't mind a little bit of an explanation for how 150, like I'm thinking it's 40 hours in a week. That's a, why, why did it take so much to get, uh, to get these, uh, to get these arrears paid? I, it's, it's, that seems like an astounding amount of effort. Uh, and I'll, I guess Treasurer Quinlan can take that. Thank you, Chair McLeod. You're, you're absolutely right. It, it is an, an astounding amount of hours, but I suppose um, I'll kind of start at the beginning or I'll give you a little bit of a, and it won't be 150 hours. Uh, I'll try and go 150 seconds. Uh, but the fact is, is because we were being very lenient, um, we were in a situation where there was, these arrears had built up over quite amount of time. Um, the landlords, obviously, in, in a lot of cases, were not necessarily aware of what that total amount was. Um, albeit, I will say, a large number of them understood that at the end of the day, the property owner was responsible. Many of them had no idea what, what those amounts had grown to. So that caused a little bit of angst for us as well, because we were being as, um, I guess, lenient is the right word with the tenants to try and ensure we could collect as much as we could um, in advance of shutting people off. Um, so oftentimes what we ended up doing, sorry, is getting into payment arrangements and payment arrangements, um, are extremely difficult because all the properties we dealt with would have a different, uh, amount, different date, different, you know, all those things. So it was a constant follow-up. And I think, um, we leaned on EPCOR to help us to be perfectly honest with that, but we weren't, necessarily always able to do that because quite often the tenant or the landlord and and generally we were dealing with the landlord solely since it was our information in order to get into touch with them um just it, it was just a a really a lot more work than i think any of us had ever anticipated and i guess again i would go back and say to be perfectly honest the build up is was a large part of that um so i think yeah I, the, the recheck and we got into a payment arrangement. We, you know, they, they failed and, or they defaulted. Now it's another notice to go back out and, and say, Hey, you failed. We're going to give you one more chance. We tried to do again, we were just trying to be very lenient considering it was the first time we had ever approached it in this way. Thank you. Uh, and as a follow-up to that, my concern is about unintended consequences. And so if we take away um, the shutting off, um, opportunity that, which of course was the last resort, but it was definitely a stick uh, that can be used, an incentive for um, for people to pay. If that is gone, um, and I understand that you're not um, going to interpret the Landlord Tenant Act for me, but what what tools are left other than getting landlords to yell at delinquent tenants, or what is the plan there? Um, so back to you, Chair McLeod. I, uh, what we've learned throughout the process um, is quite honestly, as these um, situations occur, 
we often would say to the owner, the, the, the notice would say your, your tenant owes X number of dollars. And um, as you know, you're responsible if, if the tenant doesn't pay. Again, I would say 95% of the, the, the property owners are well aware of that. And in many cases, we weren't able to shut their tenants off anyways. And that was where we went, okay, this is, this is getting a little crazy. We don't even actually ha have the ability to turn that curb stop off. Um, so oftentimes the landlords took it to a notice of, and, and, and I don't, it, it's the first steps towards a notice of eviction. So the landlord did have some power to, um, to try and get that water bill paid. Uh, so although I'm no expert and I won't pretend to be an expert, that was often the feedback we were getting from, from the landlords at the time that for those, um, specific units, especially that we couldn't shut off. Anyways, and quite honestly, I don't know about the percentage, but I want to say for tenanted properties, that was quite a lot, a, a large amount of them. Okay, thank you. And so that with that, I will call the question. Uh, and we have moved, duly moved and seconded. And so I'll call the, I'll call the vote. All those in favor. And that passes uh, unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Chair McLeod. Uh, I did want to make a comment that this financial analyst, uh, that uh, analyst Jansen is uh, in the position uh, of, uh, is one of the uh, budget items. Um, we're asking for the continuation of the financial analyst for uh, uh, several more years because of the type, pardon me, of analysis that we do need as a corporation to make sure that we can improve processes collect funds, um, charge things appropriately, et cetera. So just as a, as a real life example of the type of work that we're looking to continue and accelerate, I thought I would point that out today for the members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number six, reports and minutes of other committees. And uh, the motion on the table is that the minutes of the various committees and boards provided uh, below be received and recommendations contained therein approved. These are items 6.1, the Accessibility Advisory Committee minutes from October the 22nd of 2021. The uh, 6.2, Special Collingwood Downtown BIA Board of Management minutes from October 5th of 2021. Uh, item 6.3, the Museum Advisory Committee minutes from October 21st of 2021. And uh, item 6.4, which is the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee minutes from October 14th of 2021. Do I have a mover and a seconder? to uh, accept those. Thank you, Councillor Berman and Councillor Comey. Uh, and so we will uh, receive those. And if there's anyone wants to make comment or, or, um, or uh, comment on any of them, we can do that after we've called the vote. I call the question. All those in favor of receiving these reports. Thank you. Comments, queries, questions. Excellent. Moving on to item number seven, which is the consent agenda. And that the uh, motion here is that council herein receive the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the general consent agenda items are those of the authors and are not verified or approved as being correct. I will need a mover and a seconder on this item. Moved by the mayor, seconded by Councillor Berman. Uh, um, and so we, uh, I, do we have anything that we want to pull for uh, for discussion? Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And through you to, um, if this is bylaw, I guess I'm looking then for Director Valentine. Um, uh, I'm just wondering what the e-bike bylaw is. I mean, I mean, I've seen some e-bikes, I think, or scooters going around town. And I'm just wondering what what the purpose of the bylaw would be or what it would, what it would do to enhance uh, what seems to already be permissible. So I'm just looking for some context, please. I think uh, that we don't have um, uh, Director Valentine here, but I think that probably Director Culver could probably speak to this or Director Slamma. Uh, you two can flip a coin. Don't fight. Uh, thank you, Chair McLeod. I can start and uh, Dean can jump in. 
so I believe it would be related to like where they're allowed to um, where they're allowed to operate. Is that your understanding, Director Culver? Director Culver? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was kind of distracted and I missed the question. <laughs> so I, I was happy for you to answer. <laughs> If you repeat the question, so whether I'll, it would be like I'll on the road in. or on the sidewalk, right? Because it's not a licensed ah. vehicle, um, and uh, so just just where they would where they would be allowed to operate. I can look into it further. I so, believe. So, yeah. Sorry. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Now that I'm caught up, I know what we're talking about, and the scooter question is something I'm familiar with. Um, so around six or seven years ago, we developed a policy, a bylaw. Uh, that talked about um, motorized, uh, you know, electric cycles on uh, trails, trails and uh, um, off roadways. And uh, the challenge there was that we knew that there was it was coming. We knew that the, the electric bikes were coming, and that there was uh, going to be heightened interest. The challenge, though, is that our trails are of a varied width, and that speed is always a concern, even with uh, bicycles, just human powered bicycles. So adding electricity, um, you know ran the risk of, of increasing overall average speeds on our on our trails, um, potentially at the expense of pedestrians. So um, while I'm, you know, I completely understand the trend that the, the letter writer is, is um, referencing, um, staff would be very hard pressed to instinctively, um, you know, feel supportive of, of adding more um, motorized vehicles to trails. Um, but with councils, if council wanted us still in doing the research and, and come back with an opinion, then we would uh, happily do so. Just as a follow up, then my understanding currently, uh, Director Culver, is that we allow e assist uh, bikes, but not straight e bikes where you have a throttle kind of thing. Director Culver? Correct. The, the bylaw allows for um, human powered electric assisted. So in other words, you need to provide the human power in order for the battery or the, the motor to do its work. If you stop pedaling, the bike slows down. Um, we don't allow throttle powered um, e-bikes. Um, certainly we recognize that, you know, as they've gotten more popular, they are on the trails and, and bylaws hard pressed to, to keep up with that challenge. Um, but there is a bylaw that they can use to enforce that. So that is uh, available. Uh, we don't, um, uh, the Highway Traffic Act, uh, I will note, does, uh, does allow for it to be on the side of any road, uh, any roadway, uh, similar to a bicycle. We don't, um, we don't have any prohibition against them on roadways, but on trails, there is a prohibition against throttle powered electric bikes or scooters. Good. That's that aren't used for accessible purposes. Accessible purposes are allowed everywhere. Well, thank you for the clarification. Um, that's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks. All right. And in the absence of more questions, I will call the uh, call the vote to accept the consent agenda. All those in favor? Thank you. That passes. And then we move on to departmental updates. And uh, 8.1 is the Give It Forward ticket campaign. And although your agenda says that uh, bylaw supervisor Adam Harrod is joining us, it's actually Deputy Fire Chief Dan Thurman. Uh, who has some uh, things to say about uh, this ticket campaign. All right. Hey, Chief Thurman. Cloud. Um, of course, the expert isn't here tonight, but he did give me some Cole's notes to speak on. Uh, basically, bylaw under the umbrella of fire would like the corporate and community service standing committee recommend council authorize continue the get, get it forward ticket campaign for just the holiday season in lieu of paying tickets. Um, the intent really is just anyone who is ticketed uh, with the exception of fire routes and accessible parking violations can choose to donate food or a new unwrapped toy of equal or greater value than the ticket. Uh, the program would run from Monday, November 29th to December 13th. So basically two weeks. And then all toys and food collected will be given to local charities throughout the season. Um, Adam has informed me that this has run in the past and has been a great success. And he said, it's pretty much a great way to give back to the community. Um, there's a second part to it though, um, as per Sarah email's motion would have to be amended to include any further that the approximate two weeks prior to Christmas be free parking in the downtown subject to receiving support from the BIA board. 
Um, this would run from December 13th to January 3rd, 2022. But bylaw would still continue to monitor any people parking for longer than three hours. Um, and again, this allowing free parking is a great way to give back to the people in the local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I'll actually let's, uh, well, let's ask if there's any questions of, uh, of Deputy Chief Thurman from members of the committee. Okay, seeing none, um, we have a motion uh, in front of us, which will, uh, I think what I'll do, um, Clerk Almas, is just introduce this motion as amended, uh, or and then we'll, we'll go with that, shall we? So the motion on the floor, and I'm going to need a mover and a seconder, is that the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee recommend council authorize continuing the Gift It Forward ticket campaign for the holiday season in lieu of paying parking tickets upon proof of a receipt that the value of the donation is equal or greater than the fine amount. And further that, the two weeks prior to Christmas be free parking in the downtown subject to support from the BIA. May I have a mover? Councillor Berman and a seconder, Mayor Saunderson. Uh, discussion? Uh, oh, Clerk Almas. Sorry, thank you to uh, actually the Deputy Chief's uh, comments. It made me look at the amended wording for the recommendation because they're actually looking for it to go as they have in the past to uh, the first business day following um, New Year's. So we would actually, we'll make sure that this amendment uh, section adjusts, adjusts it so it would go to the first business day following New Year's Day. Thank you. And so as adjusted, uh, the amended motion has been moved. Uh, any questions or queries? I will call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. That is passed unanimously. Uh, we do not have this on the agenda. However, we are going to receive a departmental update from Executive Director Peg um, regarding uh, where we are at uh, when it comes to the grain terminals. There she is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair McLeod. Um, so certainly I'm happy to provide an update on the status of the grain terminals project. Um, so currently we're entering the third phase of the community consultation on the built heritage assessment. So it's now been launched on Engage Collingwood and is open until November the 10th. The survey is intended to gain additional feedback from the community related to specific features or elements that support the cultural heritage value or interest of the grain terminals and the surrounding area. The in-person consultation took place on September 18th and the virtual presentation took place on September 22nd. Both had positive community turnout. The virtual presentation was recorded and continues to be available on the town's YouTube channel. So I encourage anyone that hasn't seen it yet um, to take a moment to watch that presentation. It does highlight the approach to the built heritage assessment in general, as well as the specific draft list of the heritage attributes and the statement of value as it relates to the property. So once we have the results from consultation three, again, now live until November the 10th, the consultant will be preparing the final report in preparation to present those findings to council. I did wanna take a moment, Chair McLeod, to highlight the why of the built heritage assessment, um, if that would be all right. Well, it saves me asking a question later, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the addition of the built heritage assessment allows us to examine the grain terminals and the surrounding area to better describe the cultural heritage value and heritage attributes to help inform potential future development options. So the Ontario Heritage Act allows properties to be designated um, under both part four, so individual properties, and part five, which is a heritage conservation district. The heritage conservation district typically guides heritage attributes that apply to the character of a large area. So things like setback of buildings, layout and architectural style. Whereas part four designation on an individual property looks more in depth at specific attributes of a building. So the doors, windows, et cetera. 
both mechanisms of examination or protection are about expressing the cultural heritage value or interest of a place, as well as the attributes. However, the granularity of those um, differs. So the grain terminals are currently designated under part five. So as part of our heritage conservation district and the built heritage assessment report may, based on the findings um, of the consultants, recommend that the grain terminals and surrounding area be considered under part four. So that's the individual property designation. However, of course, for any designation to take place, a bylaw would need to be drafted and passed by council. So the completion of built heritage assessment does not legally change uh, the status of the grain terminals, but helps to inform potential future developments based on the attributes that are identified by the community through the process. There's another component that's also happening concurrently with the built heritage assessment that I'll, I'll touch on as well. And that's the advisor RFP. So in line with the recommendations of the white paper, uh, concurrently staff did issue, uh, or I should say concurrently to the built heritage assessment, um, staff did issue the RFP for an alternate financing advisor. So the RFP was reviewed by the town's fairness monitor, uh, so RFP solutions, and they had several uh, good suggestions, including enhanced advertisement to a broader audience. And as a result, we arranged to extend the RFP deadline, which closed on October the 7th. Um, the recommendations supplemented bid and go posting with additional notification to a neutral party. Um, which included a news post on the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. The advisor RFP is now closed, uh, closed on the 7th of October, and purchasing has scheduled the evaluation meetings with the evaluation committee. So I will note that the project continues to be a top priority of staff, and I encourage inter interested community members and stakeholders to visit Engage Collingwood, uh, which highlights a number of the key milestones in this project, and has links to key documents and opportunities to provide feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Pegg. Any questions from the committee? Councillor Comey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you to Executive Director Pegg. Thank you for that. So, you know, you mentioned that, you know, interested parties, and we certainly know who our most passionate uh, community members are. So because this wasn't, you know, in the formal agenda, uh, I hope that an amended agenda might be issued or something to let people know that there was this uh, great update given on where things are. They probably already know, but um, if they were looking to know, they would have had to have been looking tonight versus seeing it in the agenda. So I hope some sort of communication could go out that would uh, tickle those interested to tune in to this update that you provided. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Oh, Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and through you to Executive Director Pegg. Amanda, I just can you explain to me, because the my understanding is the terminals are already in the Heritage District. Uh, and I think you touched on it a bit, but I'm just wondering, so the built uh, Heritage built uh, form uh, assessment, um, how does it augment the current status that the, the terminals are already in the Heritage District? E.D. Pegg? Thank you, Chair McLeod, through you to um, Mayor Saunderson. So you are correct that the grain terminals are currently encapsulated within the Heritage Conservation District. The built heritage assessment looks at um, what's called part four of the Heritage Act. So it gets more in depth on the analysis of the grain terminals themselves. So a, um, a heritage district looks at setbacks within that entire area or general requirements within the vicinity of the designated area. Whereas this assessment's looking specifically at the grain terminals and the area very tightly around it and what features and attributes are um, important historically in that very tight knit area. So it's uh, more granular. And so just so I understand moving forward then this, that information then would help us to assess potential uh, 
bids uh, about repurposing or partnerships that we might enter into involving the terminals? PDP. Thank you, Chair McLeod. Um, that is correct. So the intent of the built heritage assessment is to provide us with more um, granular information regarding the grain terminals. So as we proceed through the steps outlined in the white paper, we'd have um, additional information to look at what attributes um, and cultural value and whatnot uh, the community relates to the grain terminals themselves, not um, the entire um, heritage district, but specific to that building and the uh, vicinity right around it. So uh, it's an important piece of any type of uh, repurposing or planning uh, or partnerships we might get involved with uh, or in with respect to the terminals. Thank you. So any information uh, that comes out of this assessment will come back to Council for your review and consideration in terms of how you that will fit into the next steps within this process. Good. Thank you. CAO Skinner. Thank you, Chair. And I did want to say through you uh, to Mayor Saunderson as well, um, with the, uh, the results from this study, it doesn't guarantee the, the future of the grain terminals, but it will help staff and ultimately council to assess proposals against those attributes. And I think that was uh, in, in a part what the mayor was, was getting to, which is how, how will it help? It'll help us to assess the people who, I don't know what proposals we may get ultimately in our RFP, but there may be some to use portions of the grain terminals uh, there may be some, I hope there's lots of them, but there may be some where the grain terminals themselves were removed, but somebody built something new that had the look and feel of a grain terminal or something that honored the side launch history of the area where there could be reuse of the grain terminals themselves. And this will help us as staff and the council um, and any assessment committee reflect on how to, um, how to validly uh, bring this thinking forward to the decisions that we'll make as a community. Um, so thank you. That's helpful, thank, thank you. you. So that, that assists uh, Mayor Saunderson, super. All right, uh, so that brings us to item number nine on our agenda now. Thank you, Executive Director Peg for your time. Uh, and that is public delegations. And so I'll turn again to the clerk to see whether there's anyone who wishes to uh, have five minutes of our time this evening. Thank you, Chair McLeod. Again, if you wish to address this committee regarding any item within the committee's mandate, you're provided five minutes. If you press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen, we will unmute you. And at this time, there's no further public delegation request to, to address our standing committee tonight. Thank you, which brings us to item number 10, which is other business. Is there any other business which members of this committee would like to bring forward? Seeing none, I have two items um, myself that I would like uh, um, discussed. And the first of which is, uh, is a question about uh, the items on our um, reports from other committees. Uh, and boards. And I noticed in the um, in three out of those four reports, mentions of resignations of members. And I want to be sure, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I guess, looking for some assurances that the members of our committees and boards are happy and being treated well, and that these um, resignations are merely um, coincidental. Um, and I, I wonder, uh, Oh, I guess I can start with uh, I can start with you, Clerk Almas, or perhaps Director. Oh, there he is now, Director uh, Culver. You have oversight of uh, some of these committees. Can you speak to staffing and and uh, appointments and so on? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I mean, I, I'm loath to, to speak for somebody else's happiness, but I I do think I do think that um, we have good working relationships with all of the committees that that uh, we're involved with. Um, we're definitely appreciative of the great work they do. I think that, you know, uh, coincidentally, there's a couple of people who've had changes in their, uh, their life circumstances, um, whatever they may be, and, and uh, you know, have had to make adjustments. And that happens all the time. I mean, it, it's, you know, you, uh, they're volunteer committees and you do the best you can to commit, but sometimes things change and we've had that happen over time. Um, 
but generally speaking, I would say, you know, I, I really enjoy going to our committee meetings and I'm happy um, with the committee members and, and I think they're doing a great job. So, um, so and, and all the indications that I've heard are that they are um, feeling uh, good about their work as well. So um, I hope that's the case. We'll keep trying to, you know, make that the case. Um, and, uh, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't point to these, um, these departures as a concern at this time. Um, something that, uh, you know, we always want to make sure our volunteers know how appreciated they are. And, and Clerk almost has done an amazing job in the past of ensuring that, you know, volunteers are well recognized um, and, uh, and supported. Uh, so, uh, so we'll keep doing that. But if anybody hears anything different, then we definitely want to act on that. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to be sure with three resignations and three reports, it seemed like a lot. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, my other piece of other business is uh, is to wish a happy birthday to our clerk. So not a huge and important piece of, uh, of uh, business, but business nonetheless. And then that brings us to item number, happy birthday, uh, happy uh, number 11, which makes us all happy. Uh, and that is uh, the adjournment. And I will call for a motion to adjourn. I need one. There we go, uh, Councillor Comey, and uh, we'll vote on that one. All in favor? Yes, indeed. And so we are adjourned at six fifty p.m. Thank you so much.